What up, Mike? Uh. Toronto. VK on the beat. Uh. Check. Uh. I'm in Toronto, where you wanna get the city love. Oh. I'm from Toronto, where you wanna get the city love. Okay. I'm in Toronto, where you wanna get the city love. That's right. My city love me back. Welcome to episode 1,368 of Toronto mike proudly brought to you by Great Lakes Brewery, a fiercely independent craft brewery who believes in supporting communities, good times, and brewing amazing beer. Order online for free local home delivery in the GTA. Palma Pasta. Enjoy the taste of fresh, homemade Italian pasta and entrees from Palma Pasta in Mississauga and Oakville. RecycleMyElectronics.ca. Committing to our planet's future means properly recycling our electronics of the past. The Advantaged Investor Podcast from Raymond James Canada. Valuable perspective for Canadian investors who want to remain knowledgeable, informed, and focused on long-term success. Season 5 of Yes, We Are Open, an award-winning podcast hosted by FOTM Al Grego for Moneris and Ridley Funeral Home, pillars of the community since 1921. Today, making her Toronto Mike debut is Michelle McAdory. Hello. Welcome, Michelle. How are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm very happy to be here. A little co- cooler than it was last week. I just spent the weekend in Montreal. I got back like last night. And it seems like when I left, it was like, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 degrees. It felt like. And now it's winter time. Montreal is such a great city. Have you considered relocating and living in Montreal? I did at one time. Yeah, I, I almost, I thought, I'm going to do that. And then, uh things change but it's so beautiful there i think they have i mean it's such a romantic city it's a great city but toronto's a pretty good city you're a toronto gal i am so you're uh what what neck of the woods like what neighborhood are you from in this city well originally um i grew up in the east end in the beach beaches beach what area. do you prefer i feel uh, saying the beach is seems a little like mildly pretentious i think can- so but I, and i remember um talking to my mother about this uh and she would you know she said oh no it was originally the beach and i'm like no i don't think it was i think it was the beaches anyways i i don't know from the beaches i thought that's what i would say and then you know so who knows either or yeah the okay. beach. You're, you're I, I agree. The beach is just a little bit, <laughs> you know. <laughs> hey. When I, so I, my mom, so we drove to Montreal. By the way, thank you, Hyundai. They lent me a palisade and it was very roomy. And I had, there were six of us going to Montreal and back. Wow. So shout out to Hyundai. Very roomy, very comfortable. Lovely ride. So, but I said to my mom, I said, oh, Michelle McAdory is coming over. And then my mom <laughs> went into this long <laughs> speech about how much she loved Bob McAdory. Are you related to Bob McAdory from 1050 Chum? I am. Yep. That was my, un- uh, Bob was my uncle. I think that's, I think even though I actually knew this, but that is the first uh, fun fact. Uh, I feel <laughs> like I should pull some Bob. So Bob McAdory, who I actually remember, I don't remember him from 1050 Chum, I'll be honest. I remember Bob McAdory from Global. Like he was doing sure. entertainment on the Global desk and he was great and gone far too soon, but you are his niece. I am. Yes, I'm one of his nieces, and um, I know a lot of I, I, he was he was unique, right? In what he did, he was he had his own particular uh, humor, and uh, I guess his hair. I don't know for some reason a lot of people yeah. would talk about he had his great hair. hair. Yeah, but that it wasn't all you know tightly quaffed; that it would <laughs> sort of do its own thing. And um, and he did a lot of radio too. Yeah, but a little before my time too. But I mean, he did a, some country radio too, like CFTM. But that's po- that's very possible. Like I wish, uh, like I wish I could get him on the show here. I have him I on know. a list of people like Brian Linehan, All these guys I missed. I want to talk to, yeah. and I uh, can't get Bob McAdory on sadly. But it is a uh, you kind of carrying on the McAdory legacy there, Michelle McAdory. Trying, <laughs> try, trying. Did I'm you say try? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't know where to start, but I'm going to start here, and then then we'll pick up what I missed. But I want to start. I was waiting. See, will Michelle McAdory like naturally, like organically, say the word "try"? Because then I could play this and kind of get to your origin story. But my mom also loves this song, so let's. Don't 
tell me I'm Let Jim Cuddy do his thing here for a moment. I've been watching every move that you made. Steal and you make up the heel. Trouble for the man that you take every time you walk in the room. I don't even want to fade it down, I'm digging it, but uh, okay, what do you think of the song Try? Oh, it's a great song. It's like seems like a classic, you know, immediately. That's how that song always hit me, just the melody and everything about it. Um, yeah, gorgeous song. So we're going to go pre-try, and then we'll kind of talk about the fun fact regarding you and the song, uh, the video for the song, Try. But, okay, so... <laughs> Where I pout my way through. <laughs> well, yeah. So, okay, so let's not, let's spill it now. Well, what do you have to do with the video for the song, Try, Michelle? Uh, I guess I was the, the gal who was, uh, yeah, trying. <laughs> Ama- that's amazing. Look, all these fun <laughs> facts that related to Bob McAdory in the video for Try. If that were your whole career, I'd say we'd have a great episode. Well, they weren't my feet, though. They had to, um, yeah, there was one, they wanted to do some extra pickup shots or something, and I wasn't around. And they're like, well, what shoes were you wearing? Can you get us those shoes? So they had someone else wear my shoes, and I remember okay. sort of thinking, you know what? My ankles aren't quite like that. You know, <laughs> your ankles are better. Yeah, my ankles are better. I, I, I feel the same way. I'm going to take a note here because <laughs> later I have to go to Wikipedia and make this key update. Those are not Michelle McAdory's feet. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Taking a note here for Wikipedia later. Good, All right. So you. we so I mean, you tell me your story because you did some cool shit long before Blue Rodeo was recording, uh, even recording the word, writing the word, the song try like oh. like. Bring me back because, I mean, I want to hear, like, if you don't mind. I mean, you got some time, right? You can get some detail here. Uh, I yeah. mean, you weren't even Michelle McAdory. I feel like you were Blanche McAdory. Oh, like, give God. me the story. Yeah, here. your homework. Yeah. Um, so I took off from Toronto as a, as a very young gal, person. and um, Human being yeah, from planet human, Earth. Human. And <laughs> uh, ended up, I was in New York and then I was in London. I was supposed supposed to be studying, um, but at eventually that ended, and I had just sort of answered ads, realized I wanted to stay and live in London because I had this dual citizenship and pursue music. Yeah. And so eventually I meet Kirsty McCall. Wow. That must be what you're talking about with Blanche, because right. I had taken a trip to Spain, and on the plane back from Spain, we got held over in Valencia, and they were handing out all this shitty champagne, which we started drinking. And lo and behold, Kirsty was the like across the aisle from me. Wow! And I don't even know it how how it happened, but we just start. She's was very very funny, funny witty person, and we just start going back and forth, and then singing and talking, and we became fast friends. And she's like, we have to hang out, so. We did, I'd never been in a recording studio, I'm doing the real fast version, and um, she was making a record, and she said, you know, I need to have you come in and sing with me, because we were always singing, just fooling around, harmonizing, especially waiting to, to get But this the is key, like, she could hear you sing and realize, oh, this girl can sing. Yeah, I get, okay. yeah, you know, it, like, how generous and cool, right, to do that, like, I was... 16 17 and uh wow. she just said yeah come on into the studio and so we would do all these weird accents and and one of them was our weird parody on streetcar named desire for some reason i became blanche and so i'm credited as blanche okay. mcadory on that record that's why we're heading into the uh christmas music all the time era in this you know it's just because we're going to be inundated i mean it's already started what is this november 20 it's already started but fairy tale of new york is my favorite oh, uh so christmas song of all time me too yeah i'm with you and uh can i make this bold statement you tell me if this is bullshit no christy mccall no michelle mcadory like like how influential was her and in you having a career in music well it's that's that's interesting actually i mean i was already pursuing stuff like kind of simultaneously but she opened up things i mean i had another very fortuitous meeting um 
living. I mean, I had lots of them in London. I don't know. It just seemed to happen. But I met um, Speedy Keen. And um, do you know who he is? No, I was right now. My brain is like checking all the databases He's for the name. He's very, Speedy. very important to me. Okay, tell actually. me who he is. So he, he, Speedy Keen and Thunderclap Newman. Oh and yes, he I, yes, penned uh, a huge yes. hit, something in the air. Yes, I know the song very well. Yes, and then he was producing Motorhead and worked with Pete Townsend. Anyway, so I meet okay. him at this pub. I had started making these little tapes with a guy I'd met, and he heard them, and he's like. That's it, it's right. We gotta go make a record. And so um he just mentored me in the best way. Um yeah. So he was he was also very pivotal to just learning, starting, figuring out how to write songs and uh and record and, and you're like so that. young, you're in London, England. For a moment I thought, oh, what's so great about London, Ontario, that you can meet all these wonderful <laughs> people. But no, Michelle's in London, England. That's a key detail here. And you're a teenager and all this is going on. I'm wondering why you even came back. Like, like why not just, hey, you can stay there. You could be like Chrissy Hind or something and then <laughs> start the pretenders. You know, I did stay for quite a while. And then eventually we did this band I had. Um, we had this band. We were called Cold Fish. And then we were signed to CBS, and Chapel Records, I mean, Chapel for Publishing. But, you know, I, I really also had the classic experience. I mean, I met a lot of interesting people and there was lots of side stories that are interesting. But I also had the f classic uh, experience of being totally ripped off. <laughs> and just as Speedy would always warn about all the sharks in the music business. So um, in Canada, they wanted to release this record and this song because we had mid from Ultravox. Which is also huge. Pro produce this song, which was also a very freaky for me, which is uh, just because I remember thinking. Oh, that's Love Me Today. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But it was released here. The label here, which was CBS, changed the name of our band. Is it because we had a fish? I don't like know. they don't. Come to, you know, you can't be a cold fish. F I S H, by the way, but there is a fish. P H I S H, I suppose. Uh, I think it was just again. You know, I didn't have really managed. Like, and there's a fish bone. Like, like what about fish bone? They were worried. How can we have a cold fish? There's already a fish bone. It was just crappy record execs <laughs> making a sh you know bad call. <laughs> Let's change the name to correct spelling but we're going to spell it incorrectly oh, oh my god you guys are so clever really? so how you know okay ugh. well they were thinking ahead they knew one day you have to have a uh, seo friendly name when people like in lincoln park right you have to spell it wrong so you could have the domain name and own the spelling when people right. google it correct spelling for the record was spelled with one r incorrect yeah and you didn't get a say in the matter they just no. changed your name no well, that's bullshit it's bullshit but i you know i was very young and you know maybe i should just hire a lawyer now and just go after all this <laughs> stuff <laughs> okay love me today was okay so is love me today on youtube like can i find love me today i don't know you don't know okay because you i feel like you would know if it was out yeah, there lingering like, okay whatever. was it a good song love me today by uh correct spelling well you know it became some sort of dance thing like uh, would cfny have played it i think it did Okay, because yeah, you were yeah. kind of new See, wavy. Yeah, yeah. No, it was. It had like, there was a dance mix that was done for the A side and the B side. The B side was Strange Boy. And it was a, wow. you know, good hit in some of the sort of gay clubs. Okay. So that was really cool. That was one of the highlights for me. Um, wow. Yeah, it was played, uh, you know. Alongside maybe spoons, like, you know, you're, you're going to get in her. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. Right. Shout out to Rob Proust there. Okay, very cool. So now you're, uh, something brings you back to Toronto. So what is it again that brought you back to Toronto? Oh, let's see. Just, you know, heartache, poverty, <laughs> uh, just, different, you know, disillusionment. London's, uh, living in London, not dissimilar to New York. There, at least for me, it was like, this is the center of the universe, you know, and you're, the pressures of trying to keep it all together and, you know, do something, get something happening. Uh, it, it, it took its toll, I guess. So then I, re I had met Greg Keeler from Blue Road and Jim a while back as I used to try to sneak into clubs underage uh, before I left to London. And um, so 
we had stayed in touch and they had, they were in New York, but they, Greg, I think had just moved back to Toronto and he was like, it's great here because it's like nowhere and it doesn't cost anything to live here. And I'm like, Oh, what a time to be alive. Do you know how to make blueberry pancakes? All right. I'm going to come back. So I I did. Okay. So you, you know, you've mentioned Greg. So what was your relationship like with uh, Greg Keeler when you, when you come back? Well, we were just quite inseparable, um, really like best friends, um, hanging out. And again, he, like I had these songs I'd started writing and he was very encouraging of them and to keep going. He's like, come on, let's, let's start a band. I'm like, what? Well, you've got a band. Yeah, no problem. Cause Blue Rodeo was happening, but not like, you know, he could manage two bands for a while. So he's like, let's let's start a band, and um, so yeah, we started a band. Okay, what's the name of the band you started? Crash Vegas. Crash Vegas. Okay, this is you know this is I'm trying to make this the definitive Crash Vegas deep dive. So you have a good memory of things. Like sometimes people are like, oh, I don't remember dates. Who's this? Sylvia Tyson was just on the program, and I'm like, I'm trying to go back, and you know, I don't remember dates. I don't remember this. I'm like, but how is your memory, Michelle McAdory? I think it's you know. What, what I mean, memory is quite fallible, right? We it seems to just morph and change into um, oh, someone's calling in. Listen, I am going to turn <laughs> off my ringer. I'm a very rude host, it is now off. Um, memory is pretty good, but I'm sure it, it's got its um, giant black holes. Well, listen, when we find these discrepancies, I'll bring you back and we'll have a, a panel discussion to find out the truth here. But okay, you and Greg Keeler had a romantic relationship. This is important. So so Greg Keeler and you, you start up Crash we Vegas. Did? did you? I somehow <laughs> forgot about that. It's weird, so, the memory, how it works. I just saw him at uh, the the premiere of this much music documentary. It's called 299 Queen Street West. And I mean, a lot of us were at this premiere. It was at Nate, uh, Roy Thompson. I almost at Nathan Phillips Square. It wasn't at Nathan Phillips Square. It was at Roy Thompson Hall. Don't confuse Nathan with Roy. They're two different people. But anyway, so that's why I saw Greg Keeler there. There's, that's exciting for you. But okay, he's not an FOTM, which means he's never been on the program, although Jim Cuddy has. But while Greg is in Blue Rodeo, He's got a side hustle called Crash Vegas. Exactly. With uh, sweet and pretty and talented Michelle McAdory. That's you, by the way. Oh, yeah. And what are you... Um, is it true you're also writing some Blue Rodeo stuff? Like, I'm trying to... Like, did you contribute anything to uh, Outskirts, the big breakthrough album for Blue Rodeo? No, I never... I mean, later, uh, a song that Greg and I wrote, I think they ended up, you know, recording. But no, I, I did... I was in a couple of the videos. Including try, which try. is let's face it. Uh, I say this and rose-colored glasses as That's well. It's a big one too. Look at you. Okay, I know you, I got all the good ones. You know. Okay, you know you did. Well, uh, Diamond Mine. I should have been in that. Really? Why didn't? Yeah. You know, Diamond Mine is my favorite Blue Rodeo song. Yeah, me too. Really? Yeah. That, okay. That I like you already. Okay. Uh, what was I going to say about this? You don't know what I was going to say about this. In fact, I'll come back to it actually. Uh, but you guys start Crash Vegas. I got a bunch of questions about Crash Vegas. Who else is in Crash Vegas besides you, Michelle, and Greg Keeler? Well, you are wearing a t-shirt right now. I'm wearing my Martha in the Muffins t-shirt. Exactly. So, um, I was a like I didn't know the full catalog of Martha and the Muffins, but you know, Echo Beach for me was just it was such a cool song, and it was you know as a like there weren't. Like, trying to find cool Canadian music. I mean, of course, it was Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and, and things like that, but sort of more contemporary new wave stuff, and that really... Blue Peter was pretty good. Yeah, Blue Peter was good, too. So when I learned that Jocelyn... I, I was really into the idea of playing with women, too. Uh, if, if I could find some other women that were playing, and uh, I'd heard about Jocelyn, and so I got in touch with her through however I did, and, um, yeah, Jocelyn played bass with Martha and the Muffins, and we were very lucky to get Jocelyn to come and play bass. In that's, Crash Vegas. That's, a, that's a big Jocelyn name in, uh, in Canadian musical circles. You can get the name Lanois. It usually means yeah. you're, you're well connected here. Yeah, and it's funny because I didn't know about her brother at all, and supposedly that impressed her. <laughs> that was, you had her, okay, you had her at that. The well, I think she felt so validated right. that I was after, like, I wanted to talk to her because I was. In, you know, in awe and right. like sort of this, uh, you know, 
romance with her versus, you know, oh, your brother. Right. Were you, uh, did you feel similarly when somebody would be like, I don't know Bob McAdory. I only know Michelle McAdory. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking? It's my mom. I said, Michelle McAdory's <laughs> coming over. Yeah, really? And then my mom's like, I love, she goes into this whole thing, but she loved <laughs> listening to Bob McAdory on 1050 <laughs> Chum. And I heard this whole story and I'm like, yeah, this is uh, Bob's niece. And that was the fun fact. Uh, you know, she's like, what's a Crash Vegas? Where did the name <laughs> Crash Vegas come from? That's an important detail oh, to get on the record. Here. Greg and I just sitting around, you know, trying to figure out the band name. We had some you know, bad contenders. And I think <laughs> we were, you know, it was trying to, ev we were trying to come up with something and, you know, anyways. But you came up with, that's a crash bag, <sighs> that works. I will say the worst name I think I've ever heard for a band might be correct spelling. Like I, that might be the worst name I've ever heard for a band. Exactly. Like I'm so angry. I, that's why I sort of never talked about it. It was, it was, it was just blasphemous. What can one say? See, well, that's what just you're here shuts for. it just all down. Shuts it all down. That's uh -huh. what I like. I like the silence. I had a uh, Art Bergman here, and there's a moment where he, we were talking about his wife had passed away, and they were married a long time, and he wrote a song about her, and we played it, and he was weeping, like he's sitting there weeping, and there was a moment of silence where he's like in his, and, and I was like, I'm sitting here, and I've, now I've done this 1,300 times, and I'm like, I will ride this silence all day, like I will sit, I'm no edits, like I will have now. 20, if it's 25 minutes of silence before Art says another word, I'm gonna ride the silence. Like I was so. It was a beautiful, oh, yeah, beautiful episode. Well, did I, you hear it? I, I've heard it. I okay, heard it. I, had, I didn't even want to assume. I figured no. you're like, oh, some some bozo no. in South no. Toronto invited me over. I'll talk about Crash Vegas. What a, what's this guy's problem? <laughs> so well, I'm, so I'm stuff. sitting here. You're there. You're where Art was. I'm here, and I'm like, this man. He suffered a great loss, and he's remembering yeah. her now. And he's yeah. in this moment of silence. I'm gonna ride this for 20 minutes. There was another gentleman in the room, and I love this guy, but he's like the publicist for art. And there's like two heartbeats, three heartbeats, and I'm telling you, I'm in. I'm like, I, I love this. They let this, you know, art take his mind. He wasn't even going to say that. Just sit here till art says anything. Mm -hmm. If it takes a half an hour, that's fine. It'll be a half an hour mm -hmm. of silence. You're on a run. You're listening to Toronto Mike. Why did I have a half an hour of silence? I'll be because it happened in the room. That's what happened. Anyway, Jason felt four heartbeats was enough, and he interjected. And, and I was sitting here, and I loved, there's no, no Jason, no art on Toronto Mike. Jason drove him here. Jason made it happen. Right. Jason's a great ally of the program. Right. I love Jason Schneider. Right. Love that guy. Yeah, yeah, I know. But I was thinking, didn't say it out loud, maybe till right now. Jason, you son of a bitch. Shut the hell up. <laughs> I'm right in the silence. Okay, let me have my silence. Anyway, so that silence, I'm into the silence is what I'm telling you. This is the new thing. For the next 1,000 episodes of Toronto Mike, more silence. Is that mm -hmm. a bad idea for a podcast? More silence? Ridiculous. That was pretty good. I'm ridiculous. <laughs> okay, good. You did. Was, I should have just let you ride that silence. Okay. <laughs> when does Colin Cripps enter the fray? That's a big name. Colin Cripps. Uh, we were we realized that Greg could no longer hold down the guitar. Uh, Jocelyn. Uh, it, Colin is from Hamilton, so is Joc So is Jocelyn, and. Um, she had seen, I guess he had been going, she had this little studio set up with her and Malcolm and Dan, this place called The Lab, and I guess Colin and his band had come in there, and uh, she had seen him, uh, I guess, at a couple of shows, and she would say, it's crazy, he often takes his shirt off <laughs> at the shows. And I'm like, oh no, I, I don't know. And she's like, no, no, he's really, the guitar is great. So sure enough, we were like, wow, it, he's really good. Yeah, he can learn those parts and do that. Let's get him in. When does Greg exit? Is he completely gone at this point? Like you're like, no, Greg's heart is in Blue Rodeo and we want to do something different. Like, like do you fire Greg Keeler from Crash Vegas? What's going on there? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it really just was a sort of obvious thing because they're really, they've got a momentum and, and we started to, we had our first record recorded. Uh, he is that was Red Earth. Yes, okay. Red Earth. We were down in New Orleans with Malcolm Byrne, and we were sort of the, you know, the uh, we were the first people to record there while they're <laughs> working out all the issues. They're gonna try. They're gonna break some eggs with Crash Vegas. So exactly. when Bob Dylan shows up, exactly, or whatever, they're ready and to go. all the people, right? right. So right. Um, it was fantastic to be there. I'd never been in New Orleans, and we were living there for three months. It was it was really amazing, and then our record really does you know, they're going to give it a push and we're going to have to tour. So there's no way Greg can 
be part of that. The schedule just starts to get too demanding. So it's see you later. And, you know, Colin, you're the guy. Wild. That's wild. That's keep wild. your shirt on. Keep Well, you know, it depends. Okay. Yeah, it was a depend. <laughs> Maybe you should pull the shirt off tonight, Colin. We're going to need it. <laughs> right. Well, you know, if you got to do what you got to do. Let, let me ask you a very personal question. Okay. Okay, Michelle. Right. When does the romantic relationship with Greg Keeler, like when does that end in relation to like kicking him out of the band? Uh, that happened well after the, the first record is released and doing well. And uh, yeah, we really, we start to we weren't even under contract for more records and suddenly we're the bit of a hot item and people are calling and uh, Greg and I are living together, but we're going to move out of the city. And I'd say as Crush Vegas is on its own kind of, you know, ascent of sorts. Um, yeah. The relationship is just ugh, not, you know, it's, sayonara or you know ha- it happens who, who yeah, hasn't yeah. had a good yeah, yeah. relationship go sour yeah uh-huh okay. uh-huh see i was writing that silence there <laughs> I'm, into it. I'm into the silence everybody. yeah so it was the end it was sort of the end as i was starting to make the second record which was weird timing all right and that's the, the album you named after fotm hall of famer Stu stone that's stone <laughs> right okay yeah okay yeah. what did you think of our bergman on toronto mike before I play a big jam from the first album and ask you many, many more questions. Oh, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Art Bergman. And so I just, it's, he's engaging and like the, it was great. Funny, interesting. His life is really interesting to me. And uh, yeah. He just played White Rock. Well, he's out, he lives in Vancouver. So not a, yeah. he just played White Rock and I saw that uh, Brother Bill, a uh, good friend of the program from CFNY, Brother Bill was at the show. So shout out to Brother Bill. You want to hear a big Crash Vegas jam? This is a big one. And I, when I heard this, uh, I'm like, this is amazing. You ready? Okay. What All is right. it? So was Inside Out, was that recorded in New Orleans? Um, I, or is that a, a lot Hamilton of it recording? was a lot of, there was a good chunk of things. I feel like it was recorded. Here's my memory going. I think, <laughs> I think some of it was recorded in Toronto, like it's sorry, in Hamilton yeah, at the lab. Right. And then we tweaked, you know, added some stuff and it was definitely mixed down in New Orleans. But yeah, th- there was a chunk of stuff that was recorded at the lab. Big jam. That you, I'm thinking of, you know, you guys played Edge Fest. Do you remember playing Edge Fest in 1990? Any memory of Edge Fest? Mm, yeah, or maybe. It's all, it's all, it's all a blur to <laughs> a you. But, uh, Where was it? Uh, in 1990, was it be at the on the uh, the island in 1990? They eventually moved this to Barrie, but they don't move it to Barrie for uh, a few more years. So I think you're at maybe Toronto Island. Does that ring a bell? No? Perhaps. Or by the uh, harbor front, maybe? Is, is there even... Uh, we don't know where the hell that was. But okay, no. Edge Fest in 1990, that was on Canada Day. You're playing that. But here, I got a couple of questions about something called, and I even pulled the poster for this. I'm very interested in how this came to be. I'm looking at it right now. A Gathering of the Tribes. Oh. And this was like curated by uh, Ian Ashbury from, uh, 
from the cult. And if I tell you the names of some of the bands that were on this, Gathering of the Tribes, this is from 1990, October 1990. It was in California Music Festival. And here are the acts I see on the poster. I'm going to read them in order. Charlatans UK, The Cramps, Crash Vegas, <laughs> Ice T, Iggy Pop, Indigo Girls, The London Choir Boys, Michelle Shocked, The Mission UK, Public Enemy, Queen Latifah, and Soundgarden. 1990, okay? 1990? I thought it was after that. There you go. October 6th, 1990. Staring at the poster. Really? I think so. It wasn't 92? (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to stick with my poster unless they erroneously well, wrote October 1990. We were very lucky to get on that because we had new management. Uh, another, there's uh, this guy, again, not no longer with us, Bill Graham. And he's a sort of music legend in the U.S. And do you know about him? I feel like he's a preacher. No, that's Billy yeah, Graham. Yeah, you know, Bill Graham. He Bill Graham presents, and he had okay. um, the Fillmore East, and like he put on the. He was a giant promoter and huge in the '60s, like Jefferson Arp- Airplane and Hendrix, and the Doors worked and all with that, all these people, yeah. and he managed people. So he heard our record, whatever, and he's like, "I'm gonna manage you," wow. and it was just like exactly. We're like, okay. <laughs> we don't well, you probably heard that song. That song when you hear that song in your headphones. I know you're close to that song, Inside Out. That's a great, that's a objectively a great single. Hey, thanks. What, what do you think? Can you remove yourself from being part of the band and say, I'm hearing that now, uh, that's some other band. What do you think of that song? That's a great song, right? I'm very happy with that song. Is that, is that your humble Canadian way of saying that song kicks some ass? No, no, I, I really, I think it stands up. It's I'm one. Of, it's one I'm very happy with in terms of the lyric and the melody. And it's funny though, as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking. I was thinking again of Kirsty. Like I can hear that influence and Billy Bragg. I was so into um, talking right. poetry with the tax man, like Shirley. You know, the, like I loved his uh, sense of melody and also th- that he was he had substance in his lyrics. There was something political he was always telling a story something was. political yeah. uh, I, I the last two episodes of Tr- not the last one because it's all about rusty's wake me maybe one day there'll be an episode about crash vegas is uh inside out but the last two episodes before that actually we played a billy bragg song on each of them and uh because they were kicked out by um fotm so it's one of their favorite songs we talked about it. and in both times i think i said ron hawkins from lowest to the lowest canada's uh billy bragg wow Cool. I don't know. Cool. <laughs> That's yeah. what I say. Okay. But Billy Bragg, who was, of course, uh, a New England. Is that the song? Uh, Christy McCall covers Billy Bragg. Yes, that's right. So there's a lot of crossover here. Yeah. Yeah. But there's just a sense of, of, of melody or of something being in, you know, 5 4. It's just a certain kind of thing. But yes, I, I really like that song. Great song. Okay. Now we're back to this. You write festival. some good ones and you write some <laughs> oh <my> shit <laughs> ones. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you don't want to peak too early, right? There you go. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna get back to it. But uh so some some this promoter, Bill Graham, is like, I like the cut of your jib, kids, and he's like, I'm gonna make you the next Moby Grape or whatever. And uh therefore he puts you on that bill because I mean Yeah, and we're the first ones on, right? It's almost like we're testing out the sound system. So cause you can like imagine- Moby Grape at the Monterey Pop Festival in sixty seven. <laughs> Mo- Moby Grape was the first band on before uh, Janis Joplin and uh yeah. you know, all these big deals. Well that was us. So we were there and uh yeah, it was amazing. I mean it was amazing just to be there to see all those artists that um I was, you know, in awe of. Ian Asbury uh, has a Hamilton connection, right? So he lives in Hamilton for a period of time. Like, is this where it all, is there a Hamilton connection that, because he moved with his family to Hamilton in 1973 when he was 11 years old and he spent many years before becoming a big rock star with the cult in Hamilton, Ontario. Does that connect him to Daniel Lanois, which connects him somehow to Crash Vegas? Is that your way into this festival? No, it was Bill Graham. So that's why I'm, I'm, I've, I've never heard of the Ian Asbury connection. He's to a, me, he gets all the credit for a gathering of the tri- tribe. He gets, it, 
if you look at it as more like if you I don't know the searches on this, but it was it was a Bill Graham presents gathering of the tribes but who knows like for okay, sure here's how we could be we could be always yeah not, not as the yeah, be yeah. all end all but a gathering of the tribes was a two-day music and cultural festival organized by ian asprey oh. and promoter bill graham okay. held in california in october 1990 it is considered the precursor to the Lollapalooza touring festivals of the 1990s an opinion shared by asprey himself of course he's going to think that uh talks about it was in a shoreline amphitheater in yeah. mountain view exactly. Exactly. And the Pacific Amphitheater in Costa Mesa on October 7th. Okay, well, anyway, the <laughs> event, you, you were in Mountain View. And it was supposed to raise money for uh, uh, awareness of Native American-related causes. Exactly. That's why it's called the Gathering of the Tribe. And it's a heck of a lineup, but somebody had to go first. And it's you. I mean, this is early Soundgarden, but still, I think Bad Motor Finger. Is it, maybe that comes out in 1990. But bottom line is, you've got some big, you know, Big big artists and uh, public one of my, enemy. Public enemy. Chuck D's been on this program. You're now following in the footsteps once again of the great Chuck D. But back to Crash <laughs> Vegas here. You you were there, and what happened with your relationship with Bill Graham? Like, did he uh, lose the faith, or did he keep keep rocking in the free world? What's going on there? He died tragically in a helicopter crash. It was really. I can still remember that morning being woken up, and. Told it was really, really tragic. Uh, he, in fact, I'd say that that marked a real turn. You know, when when looking back in the sure. career of of Crash Vegas, the the trajectory of that band. Nineteen because, October, one year after this festival, he dies in that helicopter crash. October nineteen ninety one. What if he doesn't? Yeah, wow. I know you're, you're blowing your mind, but I'm reading it right here. Yeah, okay. What if he doesn't get on that helicopter? What happens to Crash Vegas? We'll never well, know. Well, yeah, that's a whole other thing. I mean, mm -hmm, exactly. That's wild. We'll just leave that silence. How much time should I give it? Before I, I chime in here. Okay. So this is great. Now, now we talk, you don't remember Edge Fest, but you do remember, thankfully, uh, my light just came on. That's a, that's a, that's probably Bill Graham. He's here. Do you believe that? Do you believe in any of that stuff? You do? You're nodding. Everyone, she's nodding. Okay. So oh, that yeah. light coming on, that could be Bill Graham just letting you know That's he's here and he's hair. listening. Hair. There's an empty chair for Bill. That's what she, Patty Smith did when I saw her. She uh, pulled up a chair for um, Garcia. What? Uh, Jerry Garcia. Gar exactly. And she just I almost called him Cherry Garcia. That's, <laughs> Cherry. Like, that's like ice cream. That's, that's their nickname for him. Um <laughs> Which should be an ice cream flavor. But it is, right? Uh, ben and Jerry's yeah. made a Cherry Garcia. Yeah. So she pulled up a seat for him, and she was sure that he arrived. So, yeah, Bill. Okay, so Thanks, Bill, Bill Bill is with I know, us. Bill. Love it. A gathering of the tribes. Okay. And um, He would come to shows yeah. and then see you after the show, and he had these little cards in his pocket, and he'd pull them out and uh, tell you his observations. Well, I will just do a shout out to Ridley Funeral Home as we talk about the uh, the late great Bill Graham, who believed in your band. So Red Earth, that's the big single, but there's more. I'm just gonna play. I like you're here. I'm gonna play a little more here. Inside Out was the big single. Yeah, that's right. Ah, small. Just a little more, since you. I noticed you kind of like words. One word that starts with S. There seems to be a little bit of a theme. With, uh, maybe, mm. maybe not. You can hear the blue rodeo like origin sort of in the guitar work and everything. Like you can hear that kind of country rock flavor. Do you hear it? Well, I'd say that if there was a sound happening, you know, in the city at that time, it was that sort of alt country cowboy folk. junkies exactly it was all like handsome ned um it was just a thing and that twang also just thinking of other artists that would have been in, you know neil young and gordon lightfoot great songwriters and yeah cool yeah i say <laughs> So this is smoke. Mm -hmm. 
that S word observation was because I, I could have played Sky, but I chose Smoke, and we're about to talk about Stone. You know what I mean? Like, these are all like <coughs> one syllable S words. Hmm. You know, I know. I'm just really reaching here. Okay. Lenoir, what happened with uh, the aforementioned Lenoir that. Uh, did she leave the band? What's going on? Yeah, we had a. We just had to part company. Is there some real talk here? And again, if it's private, just say it's, it's none of your business, Mike. That's fair game. But uh, Jocelyn, uh, this has been, re- you know, referred to as uh, not like not a. It's not a um, happy split or whatever. What do you call that? Is it acrimonious? Is it? Yeah, I mean, it's. I think we had gotten. You know, sometimes there's like bands are so much about chemistry um it's a hard thing to do you know to be together traveling all the time and i think we had just come to a point where we were there were some internal struggles strife strife that's a great word yes if you like this one syllable s words strife Strife. is such a word there we go strife and then uh so we just we made a change Meanwhile, we didn't refer to this, but I know uh, Risque Disque. How do you say Risque that? Disc. Risque Disc. Risque Disc. Because he's spelt like they rhyme, but they don't rhyme. It's one of those tricky ones. Okay, Risque Disc. This is the your label, and this was like, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, but Greg Keeler suggests this label for you guys, and then they go bankrupt mm-hmm. and uh, kind of fucks you over there. <laughs> well, it was weird. It, 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 we also ended up not being fully signed, so we get this successful record it gets distributed by warners or with warners but then we're kind of not under contract so then we are free agents after we ended up going to another label whether that was you know hindsight the best thing to do or not well we could talk about that you know hindsight of course it's 2020 yes (laughs) it's just it's just the past and that's okay so we are going to talk about stone but as you know we come off this debut album with big jam you're on this uh, <laughs> gathering of the tribes, you know, and you're touring all over the place. Um, did you o- open for any uh, particularly interesting artists as you're uh, touring the uh, United States and Canada? Oh, God, yeah. We were um, we were very lucky in that regard. Um, toured a lot with the Tragically Hip. I mean, they were huge supporters. We were great pals. Uh, anybody, I think, who has been lucky enough to be on it uh playing with the tragically hip will just they're just such generous hosts they go out of their way it was amazing so we did a lot of shows with the with the hip uh radiohead we were really lucky to be on that the first time they come to north america with their hit creep and that was fantastic because what a band and and people were just so excited about that band and then also we were sort of you know able to be on that show with them and and that's amazing it was and uh who else there's lots i could still keep going but you could go (laughs) <laughs> um, I'm gonna ride this silence until okay. Michelle coughs up. Well, By the way, my daughter. So I, the reason I went to Montreal is because my daughter lives there because she's going to McGill. So she's a student there, and her girlfriends and they rented this. Uh, they're on the same street as Amy Milan from Stars. Like they live on the same right. street. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. And you could be there too if you had made the move you to know, Montreal. Hey? But her name is Michelle, so that's, I'm just bringing it up because I spent all weekend with my Michelle. I could write a song, my Michelle. You're a Michelle. You're a different Michelle. No one get confused. You're the niece of Bob McAdory. That's how my mom knows you. Yes. Michelle McAdory. I hope she's listening. Bob. I hope she is too because she's getting some shadows here. I just spent all weekend with her. So uh, time for a break. <laughs> just kidding, mom. Okay. <laughs> just kidding. She, maybe she, just in case she's listening. I'll have to make a rare edit here. Okay. So you, who did you sign with after Risque Disc goes bankrupt? We then go to, <clears throat> excuse me, London Records. Uh, in the U.S. All right, London, back in your life again, London. Yes. Wow. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Who replaces Jocelyn? Uh, Darren Watson is the first replacement. Okay, you didn't know this would be so tough here. Uh, tell me about, if it, like, how does Stone differ from Red Earth? Like, is it in terms of, of tone and, and, and any other differences that you recall? Wow, it it was quite. I mean, 
It was different. We were in LA. <laughs> that was different. It, I'd say that, you know, you have all this time where you're working towards your first record and then suddenly thrown in on our second record. Uh, I think it was try it, it was it was it was trying to be a little harder. A lot of meddling started happening again where just like in my first experience where I'm supposed to be so naive and which I was and I learned a similar thing happens where the record company kind of reaches in and pulls out some songs and sends them off to the, you know, hot producer of the moment, Butch Vig, and has him do some right. mixing. But like just because he's had a hit over there doesn't, you know, this is a weird kind of approach sometimes that labels record execs could have. Not that there's they're all bad. Some of those people are very talented and really adept and sensitive at what they do, but some just don't have a clue. But it is it also leads to an interesting debate on like like okay, so let's take an album like Nevermind, okay? Yeah. So Nirvana had a big album there, right? It was yeah. Wow. Okay. But <laughs> but the question is Okay, so Nirvana, they write the songs, they play the instrument, they're their songs, and then you get the Butch Vig treatment or whatever, but but how much of Nevermind's credit goes to uh, a Butch Vig versus, uh, you know, a Kurt Cobain? Like, like, where is the division there, and can you just apply that producer to another band and then have a uh, album, a big album like Nevermind? Abs- I don't think you can. I mean, <clears throat> I think it's dangerous to think that there is some kind of special f- i mean there there may be is special formulas you hear about those people yeah i you know it's this person and i've written all these hits for all these people and there are producers i think that have a kind of consistency of the way they work but i think it can also be a very flawed thing to just think you know well there's this piece of work that people have been working on but now we're going to send it over here and hopefully that person will you know this idea of fix it in the mix or i yeah, I don't know. That's the part of the music biz uh, that would make me feel a bit crazy. Like, I can't stand it. I could see that. And it- where's the exit? Because this no longer is about music. It seems so much about trying to fabricate, manipulate some kind of hit. And I, it's, it's an interesting question. Like where does one end? Pursuit. It's interesting. It's a, you know like you know Daniel Lenoir. So, okay. So, I you talked about the tragically hip and is it Don Smith? It's Don Smith is the producer that really helped make the tragically. I'm going to say yeah, speaking of uh, yeah Paul Langlois. There's another Langlois for you, but I believe at least Don Smith is the producer that helps <laughs> make the sound of the tragically hip. But meanwhile, if you talk to the lowest of the low, Don Smith uh, produced their follow-up to Shakespeare, my butt. And they absolutely had to, like they hated that experience so passionately that they, they did stop liking their own songs because of the bad experience they had made in, making that album with the same guy who kind of made the tragic clip. So absolutely. You can't just take a Butch Vig, apply it to a crash Vegas. And well, kind of to even be fair, the Butch was not the producer of that oh. record. He mixed, he mixed, but there was uh, John Porter, was the producer. And again, we had selected him because of his, you know, he'd been the bass player in Roxy Music. He had produced this Canadian record. Uh, there was a band called Circle C. Do you know them at all? Uh, I feel like I know Circle C. Do you sing? Can you sing some Circle No, C? but okay. it, they made this record, which I don't remember the name of. It was, it was a, I thought it was just such a brilliant okay, Circle uh, C. record. And so, oh, John Porter did that. We got to work with him. And um, it really, to me, it wasn't the right fit, if I'm perfectly honest. I like things about Stone. Like, it's hard to, especially when people who listen and support your music might love it. The last thing I'd want to do is, but it's it was a difficult record. Whereas Red Earth, it seemed, you know, even though you could have challenges and it, it seemed like we were all the right people with the same right. kind of mind, like, ushering this thing into being. Whereas uh, Stone... It was it was different, and I think if Bill Graham had been there, anyways, I didn't realize the Bill Graham. That this is interesting to be. You're right. Like this is a twist of fate. Maybe Bill would have pulled of, the plug, maybe, but, and we could have shifted a bit, and then like mm. could you know? But it does set <laughs> no. it does set in motion a whole bunch of like it's Regret. like you need to. I don't know if there's a sliding doors thing here where you go and their Bill doesn't get on that helicopter. Like what 
events would it take this is your champion right this is bill graham champion of uh of uh crash vegas if he had lived beyond you know october 1991 what would have became of uh crash vegas it, it we'll never know it's just fascinating to, to sort of think about where things shifted and changed as a result of yeah that. it is it's interesting so stone For the next two hours i want to talk about the <laughs> alternate universe i'm sorry so stone <laughs> no, you continue your thoughts on Stone. I have to do a little mop up and get back to Stone because I want to play a song yeah, from yeah. Stone. Okay, I'm sure. gonna do the mop up here. So do it. I want to shout out Cam Gordon. He actually sent in a question which I asked. I stole it from Cam. I was gonna ask it anyways, but it was a gathering of the tribes. I would love to know how they got booked on this show in 1990. It was curated by Ian Asprey. So like we did that. Thank you, Bill Graham, for your influence there. Although I have my own theory that somehow. I want to say that uh, because there was a Langlois and a Daniel Lowe and a Hamilton connection and Ian Asprey had the Hamilton connection, there was a Hamilton reason for Crash Vegas. Like, this is my own conspiracy theory that I have no proof. Uh, this is all speculation. It could just be an interesting coincidence. Of course. Because by then we are managed by Bill. But I think Jocelyn had a crush on Ian. Well, a lot of... So did I, I think. Who knows? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> Scott Turner. Do you know the name Scott Turner? Yeah. He was at CFNY. When did they shuffle him out of there? They probably shuffled him out of there in the early, or fairly early, maybe 90. Well, he was in there in the early 90s. So Scott Turner, he was uh, posting about uh, Toronto concert history. He does this. And he did 30 days ago tonight. This is on November 1st. So he says, on November 1st, 1993, Radiohead played RPM. I believe it was their second Toronto show after playing Edge Fest that summer. I, if someone could confirm if they played RPM or Opera House, Crash Vegas opened. So you're just here to tell us, was it RPM? He's not sure if it was RPM. RPM. Okay. So Scott, this answers your question you've had for 30 years, whether uh, that that uh, concert took place at RPM or the Opera House. It was RPM. I okay. think. <laughs> <laughs> you just ruined everything, uh, Michelle. Yeah. No, Come it's on. RPM. Okay. Uh, more mop up here. I think this is kind of interesting. VP of sales wrote in and said, as a student between third and fourth year university, I worked at the Hamilton Spectator in their multimedia lab and got to be on stage taking video of Crash Vegas as they played at the Festival of Friends. Do you know what that is, Festival of Friends? Is that in Guelph? I, I want to say it's in Hamilton. Like, it's why Hamilton. is Hamilton Spectator going to Guelph? Like, oh, I'm yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah, right. I feel like it's in Hamilton. It's, yeah. Do you have memories of the Festival of Friends? It sounds familiar, but I'm afraid I, uh, I don't know. Michelle, get the hell out of my basement, okay? <laughs> what are you here for? Okay, yeah, okay. I don't need you. I'm just going to read Wikipedia for the next half an hour here. Nice. Okay, let's get... <laughs> just kidding, everybody. All right, let me play. I played Smoke, right? So let me play this. Flashy silk, cosmic world, dancing in my head. Funny how I still remember things he said. Yeah. 
September morning. I we should just get our plaid shirts on our cowboy hat. It's nice. No, yeah, it, it, totally like a country rocker. Was there a rivalry between you guys uh, and Cowboy Junkies? Did you guys uh, get no. along? Or? No, not. I, I, I never really felt that. No, I. Do people feel that? Um, I'm gonna start a few. <laughs> I like to start the odd, you know, Canada Can't rock. Can't stand feud. them. Oh yeah. Um, get Michael Timmons on to trash talk you. I just remember the producer pulling me aside at one point and saying. You know, he was English. <laughs> you know, you should think about going solo and doing country. Just straight country. And I remember just like, <laughs> like, that's, that's not what I want to hear right now. I don't want to do that. Yeah. I, have to, I have to go solo now and be the next yeah. Canada's Dolly Parton or like, whatever. what? <laughs> okay, this is a song. So this, I was reading the song. Who wrote this song? Uh, I did with Colin. Colin Cripps, okay, and this yep. is a tribute to Graham Parsons. It is. I'm telling you what your song is about. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm mansplaining to you yeah. what September Morning <laughs> oh. is about here. Okay. Did you read that book? No. By Rebecca Solnit. Did you? Yeah. Can you give me the highlights so I could talk like I read it? Uh, well, it just talks about mansplaining. It's a kind of critique of, of all things like that. Can I ask you a question then? There was sure. a, a young uh, woman <laughs> who was on uh, sports radio. At the, or she was like a sports media personality, very young woman. And sports media in this country is very male dominated. Uh, that's sort of an aside. But this woman was here and I gave her what I'm going to give you right now. So I'm going to give you a large frozen lasagna from Palma Pasta. Oh, my God. Do you like, do you like lasagna? Oh, yeah. I love to eat and I like Italian food. My son will really like that. How old is your son? 20. I have a 21-year-old son and he also enjoys palma pasta. He'll probably eat the whole thing himself. Not a lot. He only <laughs> shares with mom. Okay, that's cool. So you are getting a palma pasta lasagna but this wow, is about uh, uh, really a young nice. woman on the show. Uh, we'll call her Ashley, let's say, okay? And I gave her the lasagna but at the beginning of that promotion I would often tell people how to make it like now I don't do that but because I got scared off by this moment but oh. I said I would say oh you just put it in the oven at 375 Fahrenheit put it in for 45 minutes I said it's going to be perfect like I just said that like a line like that and she sort of looked at me like angrily and she said did you just mansplain to me how to make lasagna so my question to you Michelle McAdory is I actually didn't consider her gender when I said it, nor did I consider my gender. I merely thought I should give this like advice on how to make this lasagna I was giving you from Palma Pasta. So uh, did I, was that uh, mansplaining? See, this is not silence because there's music in the background. Okay. Yeah, I think, oh. uh, that's, uh, I wouldn't have thought that, but you know, I come from maybe a different generation. Is that part of it? Well, maybe this. She is younger than than I am. I'm I'm uh, younger than us, but uh, I don't know. But, but I've never given that advice since. So you'll figure out how to make that on your own. You're on your own, but you are getting the lasagna. But you did just actually tell me. <laughs> That's my uh, secret side door uh, activity yeah. here. Uh, uh, interesting. So there you go. You can ponder. How that. did the rest of that interview go? Not so good, Al. Mm. Uh, most of my epi- most of my conversations go pretty well, but that one uh, there weren't a lot of warm fuzzies there for some reason. Uh, I don't think she quite dug me, but uh, you know that's okay. You're digging me. Uh, speaking of Dugs, okay, there's a Doug Iverson who is reviewing uh, your album Stone, which has that lovely September morning on it, and his quote that I was reading is that you guys um, juiced up cowboy junkies. <laughs> That's the quote. You guys were juiced up cowboy junkies. So maybe uh, that's where the, a lot of the cowboy junkies comparison comes from. Maybe. It's hard to know. I mean, I think that people can, you know, people make assumptions or, 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 or comparisons. Sometimes it's just easy because something is, you know, close by proximity. Uh yeah, Tor- Toronto, Tor- Toronto. There's a little guitar influence in there. It's kind of a. You'd like to think you're your own thing, sure. You know, uh, but there's a way, I guess. You know, sometimes if someone's introducing you to something else, they'll make uh, sometimes use the comparison like a tool to uh, locate something. Mm-hmm. I guess. When you're writing the songs on Stone, 
how much of the, the the breakup with Greg Keeler is seeping its way into the uh, the music? I think it was. <clears throat> I certainly was feeling it. Yeah, yeah. I felt like the whole earth was uh, kind of mirroring things. When we were down in L.A., there was a major flood. There was an earthquake and then a riot. Right. I got out just in time before they shut the airport down with wow. the team. Yeah. So it just felt like, yeah, it's like was the mirror of my internal landscape. It was all had become externalized. Just to go back for a moment, uh, Festival of Friends is an annual Hamilton thing. And I did find the lineup from 1995 and you are indeed on it. So I figured this out. In, on that lineup, I won't name them all. There's literally dozens there, but I am going to, uh, on Saturday, I'm going to see the Sky Diggers perform, and they were on the bill oh, in 1995. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, also... Here, uh, here's a good thing. Yeah. All right, so have you seen Blue Rodeo recently? Yeah. Uh, fairly recently uh, at the Amphitheater. I don't know when that was. In the last 18 months, I've seen Blue Rodeo live. Are you aware of a song that Greg does called Disappear or whatever? Of course. Okay. And he goes into, does he, he does that preamble. Yeah. Right? About the the um, sand dollars? Yeah. Right. Okay, so that's me. So I'm in L.A. You know, I don't want to see Greg. I don't want to talk to him. Okay? Because we're in that breakup thing. Sure. And so, you know, he's like, oh, can we meet? And I reluctantly, I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm going to take him to Zuma Beach because that's where I like to go. So I take him down there. <laughs> and finally, I get to tell the story, right? So... Uh, yeah, but it, it is kind of true that like I kept reaching into the ocean and pulling out sand dollars. He couldn't do it. He kept trying. Nope. <laughs> and then I'd be like, oh, look, here's another one. I pulled out like, I don't know, four or five, zero for Greg. And then, yeah, this whole disappear thing. I love it. Okay, I just want to point out that some people are like, oh, you know, why do you need to talk for an hour with somebody? It's because that's when you get that story. That story doesn't come out until you've been chatting with somebody for an hour. You know, that's how it works. You don't just open with that. Like, you got to get comfy, get a little trust going here, you chat. And now we're in, you're going to be, okay, I got a story for you. That's that's the goal, right? Yeah, that's, that's the goal. That's gold, yeah. Also of interest is that on that Festival of Friends in 1995, that the VP of sales was uh, videotaping, whatever he was doing, was also Molly Johnson was on the bill. Uh, do you have a relationship of any nature with Molly Johnson? I don't currently, but I sure remember like some of the very first shows that we ever did, like trying to test out Crash Vegas, the early, early days at the back of the Cameron and Molly would be living upstairs and, you know, she would come down and like, oh, like very encouraging. Hey guys, that sounds really good. Keep going. You know, she was just always really uh, sweet. One more name because I was chatting with somebody about him last week, Ashley McIsaac. Sure. Did you have any? Uh, yeah, he was on the bill as well. Any uh, any Ashley McIsaac stories? No Ashley McIsaac stories. No. I ended up, when I be start making solo records, working with someone who had worked with him. But I, I don't recall ever having the pleasure. Okay. So as we leave Stone, by the way, do you drink beer? Not What about really. the 20-year-old? Does he <clears throat> drink beer? Yeah, he does. Okay, okay. So you're bringing home for the 20 year old, you're bringing home some oh, nice. fresh craft beer from Great Lakes Brewery. He's going to love his mama coming home with yeah. lasagna and beer. You're exactly. gonna, it's going to be, it's gonna be exactly. a big hit. And of course, a measuring tape from Ridley Funeral Home. That's the green thing there. You, you never know. You got to measure gonna something. Come in handy. It's going to come in handy. Michelle's very it excited is. about this. It is. This song, you mentioned Neil Young earlier. I'm going to just play this song as a bridge from, see how smart I am, from Stone to Aurora, which, by the way, VP of Sales, who we've already talked about quite a bit, says is one of his favorite 90s CanCon albums. Like, he's got his 90s CanCon album chart, and Aurora is right up there. So to bridge us from Stone to Aurora is this song right here.
Michelle, do you have any memory at all of a band called One Free Fall? Does this at all ring any bells at all? No. It's, it's int- like when you say that, there's... One Free Fall. Yeah. So One Free Fall... Okay, there's a guy named Scott McAuliffe. Who, oh, yeah. Uh, he was, well, he was never in One Free Fall. So Scott McAuliffe was in Doughboys. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Montreal's Doughboys. Yeah, Doughboys. Okay. They kicked him out. Uh, Josh Kastner kicked out Scott McAuliffe. Why? I don't know. He wasn't showing up or something. Something was going down. I, right, can't, right. I, I got this right from Scott, but I can't remember. So Scott gets kicked out of Doughboys. And this is before the big uh, shine and all the big hits from Doughboys. But do- so Scott comes to Toronto from Montreal, and he becomes friends with a guy named Ken McNeil. Ken McNeil was a lead singer for One Free Fall. Right. They form Rusty. Right. So there you go. Why do I bring that up? Because... Art Bergman performed on a One Free Fall song that made its way to Borrow Tunes, which was, of course, the tribute album to Neil Young. Another great song on Borrow Tunes is this cover of Pocahontas by... Neil Young. Oh, you mean our cover, Crush yeah, Vegas. Crush Vegas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was amazed at the amount of musicians that would credit me with the like that I wrote oh, this song. Oh, they think this is your song. And I like are you have you not heard, you know. So anyways, yeah, I was surprised by that. But, you know, people you were go through catalogs s- in different ways. I was obsessive about Neil Young. I love Neil Young too. And this album is uh, this this uh, Borrow Tunes is fascinating. I feel like there's a deeper dive here we should do. This came out in 1994, but it's worth noting. So all these names are all interconnected, of course, cuz Canada is such a small little little village. But you were the thir- fourth track on disc one. There's two discs. This is uh, Out of the Blue, disc one. And you guys are sandwiched between Jan Arden and Lawrence Gowan. Amazing. Who covered Heart of Gold. And Gowan is an FOTM and Jan's not. So what What the fuck, Jan? Okay. But this is amazing. So they just, uh, the label asked you, because I feel like this is the gateway to the, this next album, Aurora, because of the label switch. Like you had some bad luck with labels. Am I right? Yeah, we we changed. It was musical chairs with labels after London. Then this was now back to Sony. I should have I should have like raised some shit at Sony about that other stuff way way back when. Why are you thinking of this now? I it's don't know. I got to call someone. I'm gonna do it. Or yeah, or if anyone someone. out there can like okay get in touch. Mm-hmm. I you need, need a DeLorean. I okay? need lawyers. I need the whole thing. A now. time machine. Yeah, that's what you need, Michelle. Okay, yeah. so you end up on Sony. Yes. But this song comes first, right? Like, where is it in the order of things? Because this is a Sony, this is a Sony tribute album to Neil Young, sort of. Like, Sony music is key in this borrowed tunes somehow. Like, there's a connection there. Yeah, I, I did they? I guess they are the ones who were. I don't even know how actually that record. But there is a be. Sony Music Canada link to the. You know, aforementioned Borrowed Tunes, which is a tribute album to Neil Young. If I ran down, I mean, Blue Rodeo is on this thing. You ever heard of them? Holy smokes. <laughs> okay. But this, maybe this is how you end up on Sony. It's exactly what happened. Yeah. We were invited to come in and do a song. And then they were so into the song. We said, would you make a record? It sounded great. Uh, did you write that song, Pocahontas? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you should just take credit for it. Oh, yeah. Be like, yeah, that's my song. Go, go you know, deal with it. I would do that. Shout out to, I'm going to shout out just a couple. So by the way, Cowboy Junkies also on the Borrow Tunes. They're just following you everywhere. But I just want to say the FOTM's on that. So Mark Jordan is on there. He's an FOTM. FOTM, by the way, you know, like, what's Mike talking about? Friend of Toronto Mike, you're now an FOTM. So Fantastic. Do you have shirts? <laughs> Note to self, get shirts. Uh-huh. And just make one and send it to Michelle. Because she, <laughs> might, she might wear it. Okay. I will. Oh, Malcolm Burns on here too. This is wow. wild, the connections here. Rio Statics, <laughs> Bourbon Tabernacle Choir. Is on this thing. Wow. He did. Everybody knows this is nowhere. Stephen Fearing. He's been over. He's and you know 
that ties into Colin Linden, but that also ties into my good friend, Tom Wilson from Junk House. And I feel this is a time to mention Junk House, who I'm going to see on December 2nd at the Horseshoe Tavern. You want to want to be my date? Hey, um, yeah, yeah, I'll go with you. And this shirt. Yeah, television. Also have a connection to Hamilton. Don't they? Well, he, he just passed away. Uh, like maybe maybe in the last 18 months, last 12, 12 months. Maybe. Didn't the drummer... I'm trying to think. Was Work the it out. Drummer, the drummer of living? television uh, has a Hamilton connection. Yeah, does he, or is it just that Dave Rave was from Hamilton and Ogilvy, knew the drum? right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, Dave Ogilvy. Okay, so we go. here we are. Billy, Billy is the drummer. Yeah, F- Fika. Right. Okay. Where's he from? Brooklyn. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right now where this guy is from. This guy is from Delaware, <laughs> but. <laughs> Well, you don't know. Maybe he visited Hamilton, Hamilton once or twice. Hamilton, Delaware. Okay. I'm just looking here. So, yeah. So, Tom passed away, like, very recently. Tom yes. Berlain. I got to see them at their last show here. Amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Was it good? was amazing. So I'm Dave, a huge television fan. Yeah. Well, Dave Rave is your hammer guy, so. Yeah. Uh, and I think he, I think that's what it was, is that he knew Billy. Uh, maybe they even played I got it here. together. Okay, okay. Is that what it was? Well, yes. Okay, drummer Billy was featured on album an album by Dave Rave. That's what it is. So they were connected. Good job. See, that's this is great. The longer we talk, the more we're going <laughs> to unveil here. Very good. Now I mentioned Tom Wilson because uh, what you were uh, signed was it Sony wanted to get some like cool bands basically. Exactly. You were, like, on the list. They of needed cool the cred. Yeah. <laughs> so you and Junkhouse to the rescue. Is that right? Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, come on to the, the, the horseshoe on December 2nd and see Junk House. You'd have a good time. Wow, it's going to be Junk House. Cool. Yeah. Will Colin be playing? Well, maybe. Oh, I can't I go can't then. I can't commit to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, you and me. <laughs> All right, we'll go somewhere else. <laughs> okay, I'm in. We'll go to the Rivoli. I, I, I got a, Neil Young's playing a private party for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so your date. It's going to cost us. You got $2 million we can uh, put together for we'll that? We'll bring him some lasagna <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> Done deal. Thank you to Palma Pasta here. Uh, I just realized when they're signing all these cool bands, and I mentioned, I shouted out Junk House, but Our Lady Peace was on the list. You must know this, that Our Lady Peace was one of the bands Sony signed to be mm-hmm. to up their uh, cred there. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Do you remember playing Edge Fest in 1993? I don't know that I remember it particularly. You mentioned the hip earlier, so we can shout out another roadside attraction. You were on the the bill with Midnight Oil and Hot House Flowers. Yeah, that was a How fantastic was that? tour. It was so much fun. Did you get to know Gore Downey personally? Yes. And sadly, uh, since I'll never get him on, uh, he's passed away, as we all know, because the nation was in mourning. We still are, potentially. I learned a guy, I was in Montreal, and I learned that their, this is going to sound kind of weird to say out loud, actually, but their Gord Downey just passed away. Like, they had a uh, big, big French music band, Tremblay. Yeah, I And I in 47, that. he just died of cancer. And, yeah. I mean, I, uh, look, I'm telling you straight up, I don't know this band at all. But uh, these French-language band, m- massive in Quebec. Yeah. And around the world. Yep. I, okay. I followed that, too. And yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, my heart's with Quebec, losing their Gord Downey here. Exactly. But Gord... Uh, any any memories of Gord? Sure, uh, I Gord and I love just hanging out, talking about literature. Uh, I was there was lots of humor. I remember because I'm into sports, but <clears throat> they would joke and say, "Okay, Michelle, show me how you hold a hockey stick," <laughs> and. I guess exactly. Sure. That's the laugh that happened as I'd like try to, you know, mine you're a hockey the fan? hockey stick. I sure, but no, my I'm more like I'm quite obsessive about basketball okay. and baseball at times. But really, right now, I'd say it's like a, a huge basketball era for me. Okay. The past years and years, just basketball, basketball. Amazing! I mm-hmm. didn't know that. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I like basketball too. Yeah, I, I like sports in general. But you didn't know how to hold a hockey stick. No. So, anyways, and and that would be funny. But you know, it was about uh, here. Have your Making me a peanut butter jelly sandwich after the show. Uh, just hanging out, talking music and books. And um, yeah, just really thoughtful, thoughtful, kind human. Spark 
Sparks can burn your hand Loudspeaker sends a sound Shoots you out Just like a satellite From Aurora, here's a quote from Davna Doyle, also been over, but she said she wrote in her book that when she moved to Toronto from Newfoundland in the mid 90s, she'd play this song over and over and over again with her friends, and then she'd eventually uh, cover this song with Shay. I know, I heard that, and like that's such a cool thing. I, I love that idea, like the fact that you write something and it goes out there, and other people might. I mean, besides people either listening and and liking, loving something, but that they then go and do a version of it. That's really amazing. Do you think this might be your second biggest hit? Would, it, would this be number two? I think it's number three. Okay, what's number two? Uh, in Inside Out and Smoke right. were, I guess, from that first record. And then, yes, I guess it would be this, other than also the cover of the... Pocahontas, Pocahontas, the song you wrote? Yeah, the <laughs> our version. <laughs> who is in the band now? You'd Pardon be surprised. Me. Okay. You oh, would right. be shocked. The people who, the, the who, people who think the you mu- wrote that. The musicians that said, that was an amazing <laughs> song you wrote. The lyrics well, so great. scary thing is, Colin Cripps thinks you wrote that song. So <laughs> that, that's what concerns me. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to text Tom and tell him Colin can't be in uh, Junk House on December 2nd when I come okay, with you. So where who is in the band now? I've lost track because it's you and Colin are still there. But is that is now, else gone? Oh, right. Now it's Eric Cheneau and Gavin Brown, who's like Mr. Big Producer Man. Okay. So what's going on? You have a... You have a I, I, you're having difficulty keeping personnel in this band. Yeah, you know, it's interesting what was going on. It's like a vibe thing. Again, chemistry. Someone wants to do something else, this, that. So you just make the changes. And, um, yeah, that's what happened. Okay, but the meanwhile, this is on, uh, you know, on uh, high rotation, on much music. And this is getting a lot of airplay in this country. But what about outside the borders of Canada? They don't even know this song took happened, right? On and on, Lodestar. This is uh, Canada only. Was there uh, something's going on with distribu- distributing? How do you say that word? Distributing this album uh, beyond the borders of the great white north here? Yeah, I mean, a lot of this comes down to, you know, who's, who's your team? Uh, what are the politics at the label? Are they like there's so many other things at play? You can have great songs, music, but if you don't have the full team pulling the levers, you know, I mean, there's so many different ways. Now, of course, people can go online, post something, and whatever, it goes viral. I guess I hear about this. <laughs> you needed Bill Graham, okay? I did. You know, <laughs> well, he's, you know, he's, right, he's right, here. right here. The light came on, and that is a <laughs> true story. People can make me the light did come on when it we're did. talking about Bill Graham here. I didn't. Write down who wrote this, but somebody... Oh, no, let's save it for the solo. We got a little bit more of the solo time. Maybe that's cool Cool with you. Yeah. I do want to just give you another gift here before I go beyond uh, Crash Vegas and find out why Crash Vegas crashes and burns. What's going on? This is a wireless speaker courtesy of Moneris. And Michelle, you bring that wow. home. You can listen. Yeah, you can listen to... Uh, Man, when am I coming back again? <laughs> what are you doing tomorrow? Okay. <laughs> 
That's cu- why does Moneris want you to have a speaker? Well, they want you to be happy. You can listen to anything you want, but you also should definitely listen to season five of Yes, We Are Open because award-winning podcaster Al Grego has been, he went east this time. So uh, Maritimes and Newfoundland, and he talks to small business owners and he collects their great stories and he shares them with us on the podcast, the free podcast, Yes, We Are Open, to inspire the heck out of us. That's the kind of good work they're doing at Moneris, and that's what Al is doing, and that's why you have a wireless speaker. Wow, thank you again. You're speechless. I like the silence. Oh, that's right. It's amazing. Well, oh, can, yeah. I whoa, 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 whoa. can I give you something? Yes, you is can. It, is it the right time? Yeah, sure. I, I, you know, there's no script here. All right, here you go. <laughs> How dare you interrupt me? There okay, Michelle, go. I'm going to play by play. This is for you. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to play. You know what? Because I have this in my hand and because I'm going to do this right now. I am playing a song from this album. It's called Into Her Future. And this will be a fantastic segue to your solo life. And there you are in the back. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Found a window that looked right out into her future. Saw it clear as crystal when the light makes rainbows off its tips. She did dip her hand and steal water from an open well, making a dive. This is beautiful. Into her future. You wrote this song. I did. Do I hear some Greg uh, Keeler on this song? Greg, uh, yeah, he helped bring this record into being. Uh, yeah, he was. It was really great. I was like going through so much. Uh, <laughs> oh my god, it was such a time. But so I had all these songs and just going out to. Greg's place, which is where I'd originally lived in the ones, but like left way back when. But well, anyways, here we are again. So we're pals. And um, but how did you become pals again? Well, because you know we. I don't know about you, Mike, but like, mm-hmm. how many of your exes are you friends with? Like friends, friends. Like let's go see Junkhouse at the uh, Horseshoe Tavern. Yeah, or you know different. Mostly, I have had friendships after. There's a couple of... But anyway, so Greg and I have always been just kind of more like family and good to each other, even though, you know, he might have... I broke his heart way back when, and then he, I guess, tried to retaliate in some way. And then... But anyway, <laughs> be good. I'm glad he's not here. Or maybe you should get us both here sometime. But... We've just always maintained... That's an episode f- right there. Yeah. A friendship. So... And a very good friendship. And so, yeah, he he had this set up at his place, which he doesn't anymore, but where, I guess, Blue Rodeo have been recording there, different people, lots of people have been making records out at his place. I made my first solo record there, Whirl, and then... Where is this place? It's, so it's about an place. hour east of the city. Um, it's just my water... Um, as long as it's not the beer. Yeah, no. <laughs> Whoops, I started <laughs> drinking one. Um, anyways, so yeah, like an hour east of the city. And uh, it's just a really comfortable place. It doesn't feel like a, you know, recording studio in the classic sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he is 
he was very instrumental in this record being born. I like hearing this. Born. I'm so happy he helped birth this uh, album. Absolutely. Of yours. Oh yeah. So okay, well let's let's say goodbye to um, your band here because because we need some closure here. So why does Crash Vegas come to an end? Truthfully, no lie to me. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Colin and I were feeling a kind of divergence of uh, aesthetic kind of direction i also felt very disillusioned i'd say with with the just the way how we were going about things music business and um i think colin i don't want to speak for him but i think he also wanted to go in a different direction and so it just you know it was one of those things where it was kind of sad but also felt really like the right thing at the time. Now, earlier you made a little aside comment about, is Colin going to be there? Because he <laughs> was on to be in Junk House and Junk House, <laughs> I'm going to see Junk House. But was that a joke or is that like, can you guys, are you guys friendly? Are you civil? Like what's going on with Colin? Oh Cripps yeah, and we Michelle would be We need to know. Canada no, no. music scene needs to know. <laughs> we would be friendly. Okay. It would all be fake, but we would be friendly. No, <laughs> <laughs> no we would be friendly. We would be friendly. Okay. We had a reunion. Tell me about the reunion. We uh, basically, Warner's decided to re-release Red Earth. And um, so as a result of that, we did a reunion show at the Danforth Music Hall. And that was really fun. It was, yeah, it was really. What year was this? That would have been 2017, I think. Okay. Yeah, All right. All I right. think so. By the way, just before we say goodbye to Aurora, I want to shout out FOTM John Bora. He put, he's on that album. John right? Bora, exactly. He played all over Aurora, and so did um, great drummer oh. Mike Slosky. S- Mike Slosky, right. fantastic drummer. Okay. Oh my God, he was so great. So yeah, Gavin and Eric would be the touring band. They didn't play on the record, but. Right. But John and Mike. Laura was in, uh, you played in uh, Change of Heart for a little while. Yeah. You don't Ian Blurden's stories for me? What's going on? I no, think that guy's I don't. a cool cat. He is. I'm afraid I don't have any stories right. other than. What are you doing here? Just sort of being, you know, and I, I remember. For your return, I just want, I know you don't know, I've, you don't have any, but collect <laughs> Ian Blurton's stories and just come back and share them. <laughs> All right, me. I'll go. I'll, I'll start calling him or, you know, figure out where he is. Do a little, you can produce the uh, Ian Blurton. Well, he's been on, but I want to get the uh, perspective from others here. Okay. I do not know who wrote this, but somebody said, I bought Whirl in 2000 when it first came out, an astonishing record that is still one of my favorites. Wow. Well, thank you. Okay. So what, so like, obviously when Crash Vegas comes to an end and you and Colin go your separate ways or whatnot, you decide I'm just going to, I don't know if you're going to make country music, obviously, but you're going to go solo. Yeah. Yeah. I start, I go freight train riding and, uh, Start in the rails. I do. I do. I had a friend who was doing that. I couldn't believe it. And then he's like, all right, come along. Like a hobo? Well, he's an artist. But yeah, I guess you could say like, or like. you have that stick with the bag at the end? Al Purdy. Like a poet, like Al Purdy. Um, It just seemed like it was something that happened in another era and some other, yeah, universe. But the fact that it happened, and I've always had an obsession about trains and because uh, I used to ride them when I was really little to go wow. see my grandmother. Um, Where did your grandmother live? Woodstock. And okay. I had another grandmother who would take me to Niagara Falls. So okay. I would like trains were just, oh, just love them. So I got to, to ride some freight trains. And then I remember recording sounds. Actually, this is funny. So Sarah McLaughlin, I'm, I'm now solo. And she's like, OK, I'm going to put together this festival, Lilith Fair will you come and be on, you know, play a little fair? And I'm like, oh, yeah, of course I'll come. Wow, thank you. So meanwhile, I have these new songs, but I decide I'm going to open with my spoken word piece. And I have this <laughs> loop of crazy <laughs> recorded freight train sounds. Wow. And so I remember I knew the sound guy, thank God. And he, like, the soundtrack was wild. And it's in a big stadium 
And uh, I just remember looking at people who were like, what the hell is happening? And I, I'm reciting my poetry. That's amazing. It's kind of amazing, actually. That's kind of amazing. And of course, you what know, Neil happened Young. happened to her? <laughs> Neil Young had a, uh, I don't know if he, I think he might have sold a bunch of it, but he had a massive like, model train collection. Yeah. Just bringing it all back to Neil. That's what yeah, I do right now. Exactly. And you also know this, Michelle, because you are a talented uh, musician in the city of Toronto, but you know that you cannot jump a jet plane like you can a freight train. Like you know this. This is just a fact. Yeah, you can't. No. Okay, so I love the idea of you riding the rails. Like this is like, and this is pre-sun, right? I'm doing the math in my head. Yes, so sun that's is right. Cause, cause, yeah, I have, so I've, I mentioned I have kids. They ruin everything. Okay, you can't be riding rails all the time. When you got like a kid, you got to feed and take care exactly, of it. It really exactly. does mess everything up. But you have that period of time pre-kid where you can ride the rails. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was an important thing to do. And Whirl came out of that time. And um, I, I'm really happy about Whirl. So thank you for the... I wish I wrote down who said that. Yeah, so. that was nice. Uh, <laughs> because I, I really liked that record. Of, it, it was an important record. It was the first record I made post-Crash Vegas. And uh, I, I did that with, uh, with Eric Cheneau. Actually, we did it at Greg's. And Greg plays on it plays on Mona. Does he play on anything else? I don't know if he does. But um, he plays drums, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, on the song Mona, which is a really cool song. And um, it was just a, an important record for me to make because it was the first one. Sure. After, sure. And it's, it's all band. you now. This is, this is Michelle McAdory. Niece of Bob McAdory. That's what it said in the smaller font right underneath. Michelle McAdory. <laughs> niece of That's right. Uh, <laughs> who? <laughs> as, My mom as your talk. mom would say. Come on. Big, honestly. And then again, again, I know him from Global. I know back to Bob. That's how we close it. Full circle. Almost uh, perfect circle. Chalk circle. Chalk circle. Chris Wardman produced that album with April Fool. And he was the guy from Blue Peter. So it all comes back. Okay. Cool. Also produced Fluke for Rusty, which cool. one of the great albums of all time wow amazing. by rusty okay so shout out to chris wardman also been on this program but um and it doesn't even matter where i was going because i just want to shout out one more podcast here this is important if you want to learn how to plan invest and live smarter the raymond james podcast the advantaged investor is for you so it's also free much like yes we are open and whether you already work with a trusted financial advisor or currently manage your own investment plans the advantaged investor provides the engaging wealth in management information you value as you michelle mcadory pursue your most important goals which might be riding the rail now he's 20 you can ride those rails again yeah <clears throat> i think it's changed it's well i probably could somewhere but i don't know well yeah uh it has changed because i wanted to last year i went to visit my daughter in montreal i took via rail and uh this year it was going to be 250 bucks a person to get to Montreal and back. And it actually, be, it just didn't make sense like uh, financially because uh, I ended up borrowing a car and getting there on the 401 because it was going to, you know, six of us going, 250 a pop. It just became kind of ridiculous. So it's not the same as it used to be riding the rails. It's too bad. It's such a great way to travel. I know that when I go up north, like the Northland or Northland line, they, they stopped that. And uh, there's talk of it coming back. I hope it comes back. Oh, you reminded me of a place I want to go before we say goodbye. But I want to read uh, a note that came in from PT Players. PT Players says, We need another Crash Vegas reunion and a new album from Michelle. Still enjoying Into Her Future. How long ago did Into Her Future? I'm holding it right now, vinyl. Thank you very much, Michelle. But how old is this album now? That album came out late 2016. So... I had hoped to start making something new, um, the end, like 2020, but we all know what happened then. So I'm working on something. Now. You're actively working on a new album. I want to make the announcement right I here. I haven't everybody. started recording it yet, but I'm in some rehearsals and working on all these. Any songs special that I guests? Love. Um, not. I don't know. I can't say. You yet. can't say yet. Will it be produced by Greg Keeler? I, I don't, yeah, I can't to say. To be decided. Know, okay, yeah. do you have a title for this album yet? It mm, hasn't come to me yet. hasn't come to you yet. Okay, but this is something that we might be able to hear in 2024. 
That would be amazing. God, well, you do. What if I could get <laughs> do it I get together to make the call that on fast? That? Yeah, I want to know if I can make the call on that. Uh, I want to say that maybe you come back in about a year to unveil like a listener oh, party. We play the new album, that'd we talk great. about it, and we catch up. And then we can find out what happened with Ontario Place because I do follow you on Twitter. And I want to close with this oh, yeah. because one of the main, uh, are they called? Architects, uh, what do they call the people who planners, they organizers? Plan, they plan no, they, oh. they plan parks and stuff. Like he worked on Trillium Park, and like, city planners, or whatever they do. These important people who plan public space and stuff. Yeah. He quit the team. He he said that uh, they that they would be cutting down eight hundred trees mm. to build the private spa, mm-hmm. and he says the. the if you want to be back to nature, the trees will do far more good than the private spa. This is all obvious stuff. And I've been ranting and raving on Twitter about this for a while. Cause uh, I can't believe we're going to spend taxpayer money. I can't believe the private spa is going to go on Ontario place site. Hey, go put it on somewhere else. Like get off the waterfront and put it somewhere else. You can, have I don't want spa. it at the X. I know this is this sort of other proposal. That's what they're saying. Yeah. And I, I just like, why stick this giant spa in the downtown core? It should be, out. And where does this passion come from? Like that's where the smell comes off this. Like there's a stink on this because where is this massive passion from this government to have the public spa in the first place? Like, is there a massive outcrying from Ontarians that say we we need more private spas? Like, is this something I just miss? I mean, I don't really know Doug Ford, but it seems to me his aesthetic is more of a kind of, you know, suburban aesthetic we from Etobicoke you know out uh, and I've, I've been recently going back to Manhattan and I just I love New York City I it's my one of my favorite places ever and I walk around there and I just think they've got a lot of things that are right I mean you could critique lots of things but I think it's so important what we do in this city and yeah hopefully we're gonna preserve that land down there and make it really amazing now, he did reverse uh, decisions he made regarding the green belt because yeah, they were unpopular. he's corrupt. <laughs> right. He's, he's allegedly greasy as fuck. <laughs> I just said it. I said yeah, it. yeah. Let's just say it now. He's allegedly greasy as fuck. But the <laughs> Ontario Place, here's my concern here before we say goodbye, is that right now the outcry about Ontario Place is coming from Torontonians, okay? So this land is owned by, you know, it's Ontario's land. So it's the province's land. And Doug Ford is the premier of Ontario. His party had the majority for the second time, blah, blah, blah. So Toronto being mad about this doesn't hurt Doug Ford because Toronto except for where you are right now, there's very, very, very few pockets where the MPP in the 416 is actually from the PC party. So most, the overwhelming majority of Toronto, they went liberal or NDP. We don't typically vote in a conservative government in the 416, except in this neighborhood you're in right now, which is another (laughs) story I'll talk to you about later. But, so therefore, I feel, I feel, my just anecdotal kind of observation is that Doug Ford is less uh, likely to act because Toronto is mad because it won't hurt him where it matters, which is at the polls when the next election uh, happens. So we really kind of need the rest of Ontario to get a sniff of this and to start to get angry with how much, you know, taxpayer money would be going into this private spa and parking spot on Ontario Place. Like we need people beyond Toronto to say, hey, this stinks. Exactly. I mean, I think with the attention that the Greenbelt issue has garnered and the fact that we've had that integrity commissioner report and whatnot and now there's being one i guess there is one uh, coming yes yeah so Ontario maybe plans. it's just about everything sort of stacking up and finally people go okay maybe maybe this isn't the right approach in general i don't know I, it's some days i feel a kind of you know hopefulness and other days i get a little cynical about it but we'll use that when you're writing this new album i feel like a little <laughs> like cynic Ness, cynicalness helps with songwriting. I feel that's a good thing for a songwriter. Maybe. You're gonna write a song about this. Uh, you don't have to call it, you know, Toronto Mike. You can call it whatever you want, but maybe a, a line or two in there about your experience. I'm going to be it? teaching some songwriting. Okay, well, yeah. What are you up to these days? Obviously, you're working on the album, but what else are you up to? And how was this experience for you? Well, this ex- it's great coming here, actually, and doing this. I've just started to get turned on to some podcasts. And so, um, and I've listened to your podcast, Mike. So this is great. It's great to see you do your ads live. Mm-hmm. That's really fun. Uh, and 
what else am I doing? Yeah, working on music and teaching a songwriting. Anyone wants to learn songwriting through U of T. That's cool. At the uh, University of Toronto Continuing Education School. So that'll be in uh, 2024. Wouldn't February? it be funny if I take this class? Like Michelle yeah. McAvery, <laughs> teach me how to write a song here. So that's cool. I went to U of T. Uh, I can come back and uh, take a songwriting course. There you go. That's it. Other than that, you know, plowing away on the songs. And, uh, yeah. And making lasagna? Yeah, that's how, a, how do I do that again? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask. Okay, <laughs> let me explain it to you one more time, Michelle. I can't believe I have to do this. You know it's 375 <laughs> for 45 minutes, okay? <laughs> write that down. I'll write it down for you. I'll send you an email. Oh, thank you. Let me mansplain to this, this to you one more time. Okay, you got your beer. You got your lasagna. You got your smart speaker. You got your measuring tape. I just want to quickly... Shout out RecycleMyElectronics.ca because, Michelle, if you have any old electronics you need to get rid of, don't throw it in the garbage. Those chemicals end up in our landfill. It's bad for everybody, okay? True enough. Go to RecycleMyElectronics.ca and find a place near you where you can drop them off to be properly recycled. It's been accredited by the EPRA. You can't go wrong. That's great. Good to know. Do it. And when the new album comes out, you come back here. All you right. understand? I'd and I'll give you more like lasagna. That. I'd love that. And I'll explain again how to make it. Yeah, 375, 45 <laughs> minutes. Michelle McAdory, niece of Bob McAdory. It was an absolute pleasure. I loved our Crash uh, Vegas deep dive. And then we got to learn about your solo work. And I really enjoyed this. Thank you for oh, doing me this. Me too. Thank you for having me. And that brings us to the end of our 1,368th show you can follow me i'm on twitter and i'm on blue sky i'm at toronto mike and michelle is at m mcadory that's right m mcadory Mm -hmm. you can hear her takes on (laughs) ontario place and more you and i should chain ourselves to the trees let's do it although if that will impede my ability to go visit manhattan i don't know okay it might we could be there a while yeah well especially if i get arrested right that is yes okay you're always thinking ahead I, that's what that's why you're that's a my great son. visionary that's my son's voice <laughs> well he's right listen to him thanks to all who made this possible the, that's great lakes brewery that's palma pasta that's raymond james canada that's Moneris. that's recycle my electronics and that's ridley funeral home see you all you won't believe this michelle but later today another toronto mic will drop wow featuring jason Priestley. jeez you wow. missed him by this much. Oh, my God. But first, I got to pick up my youngest daughter to get her cast removed. She wore a cast for six weeks. And here's my thing. I am not certain how long that will take. I might be standing up Jason Priestley because I'm stuck at uh, St. Joe's in the uh, Fracture Clinic. He's probably been stood up before. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Tori Spelling. See you all soon.